Hello and welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we shift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler, and today we're talking about a very difficult problem for a lot of people, which is balancing autonomy with connection. So this is something we've been talking about back and forth for for quite a while as a, a theme, and we thought it would make a, a good show topic. So why is this such a, a big problem? It's, I don't know, the, the human condition of like learning how to be in a relationship and not be in total control of uh, everything you have. That, that And a lot of times we overshoot thinking that that is going to be the best way to go about things. What do you think? Well, I I think we've got like two compatible but often competing goods at play here. Um, We'll talk about what autonomy is in just a bit, but let's just throw the word out there and and say it's a good thing, right? So being autonomous, developing as as a person, getting to make your own choices, we usually look at that as something good. And then we also value connection with other people. And, you know, what we're talking about here could apply particularly to romantic relationships, but it could just as well apply to friendships or other kinds of partnership or even, you know, work colleagues, um, fellow students, roommates. You know, there's this, this need that we have as human beings, at least some of the time, for being involved with, being intimate with, being connected with. With other people. So, you know, it would sound like, okay, well, that's not a problem, right? You're just uh, two autonomous people, or, you know, maybe multiples of them uh, within some sort of, you know, matrix of connection. But I, I think for a lot of people, this winds up being quite, um, quite difficult. And, and sometimes quite scary. And then you can have two people who, who reinforce each other's tendencies with this as well. And, and, you know, so, you know, this show is about philosophy. We're going to talk about some philosophical concepts that can help with this. But it just very broadly speaking, I think that a lot of people, you know, when it comes to relationships, they, it's sort of like, you know, doing, doing, um, other preparatory work, you know, the best time to have done something for a crisis was like six months ago to start training for it. Right. And then the second best time is now when you're in the middle of it. And I think with relationships, it works the same way. People just sort of assume that they're going to work out. They're going to, they're going to flow along normally. And, and so, if they don't put in the time to understand what's going on and to maybe make some choices to do things a bit differently, then, then when the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan, um, they wind up in all sorts of problems and, you know, there's recriminations on both sides. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and I want to make sure that we're, we're conveying that we're talking in all sorts of relationships, not just romantic, but also yeah. friendships, you know, work boss relationships, um, and like roommates, anything that you know puts you in association with others that, you know, a lot of times that you have to rely upon or that you have some long standing engagement that we are there. And um another thing is kinda this is building on I think one of the reasons we talked about this was our uh, episode on building good boundaries and yeah. how it is dependent upon a, a lot of times the type of the relationship that we are actually speaking about in this moment. Yeah. And, you know, the boundaries thing is interesting because you think about friendships, for example, there are people who 
in a friendship don't observe a certain kind of, let's call it reserve, uh, with, with their friend. And they think that if you're friends with somebody, well, that means you share everything together and you, you know, you can say and do anything you like in front of the person. And the other person might not be so cool with that, but you know, then maybe they don't say anything about it the first time that it happens and the other person gets the wrong idea. And, you know, it would be great to have set the boundary at the beginning, like I was mm-hmm. saying, right. But oftentimes we're, we're having to do this almost retrospectively we say you know i didn't like when you did this thing and then i mean this is this is a a a little bit of a a digression here but this is a very very common dynamic in relationships when there's a potential for a fight to take place person a says i didn't i don't like when you did this thing that you did five minutes ago and person b says "Oh, oh well i you know it was for this reason and all that and then person a says See, you're not really listening to, to what I'm saying, and you're not, you know, you're not um, dealing with this. This is this is something that you've done many times. And then person B will say, "Oh, no, 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 we're just talking about right now." And person mm-hmm. A is like, "Well, I don't want to just talk about right now. I want to talk about this thing that keeps on happening." And now you now you've got you know the potential for a great big fight. People are are you know they they're taking opposite sides, and they're not just you know like in a back and forth thing like in the cartoons where Bugs Bunny says, you know, no, and Elmer Fudd says yes, and they go back and forth until Bugs Bunny pulls the switcheroo on him and says yes instead of no. It's it's at a meta level where um, they're not only arguing about something substantive, they're also arguing about, well, what are we actually doing right here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that, you know, that ties in directly with some of the things we're going to talk about. Because when that happens, it's as if um, both partners are trying to control the story. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's a, a struggle on a, on a higher level. And, and it's often, you know, quite a problem. This ha- and like you say, it happens at friendships. It can happen when you're dealing with your boss or if you're, you know, coaching an employee or something like that. It certainly, I'll tell you, it certainly happens between st- uh, teachers and students as well. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know. that, and there's a kind of like a built-in kind of you thinking that someone's talking a almost a, a hypocritical way and that's like oh you well you let me do this thing all this time and now oh, yeah, you bring yeah. it up now why wasn't good uh, why didn't you bring it up the, the beforehand and and i think that's a kind of a fallacious way of going about that it, it, it took you until this point to like one realize it is uh, thing that you find to be problem, yeah. and we have yeah. the autonomy uh, to go back to our topic here to uh, make decisions and change our minds. Yeah, so let that, let's take that as an opportunity to jump in and clarify um, some terms that people might not be completely familiar with. We're using this word autonomy, and and deep down, I think everybody has the same basic set of ideas about this. It's kind of like a constellation of a couple different ideas, but they might not be using that that term. Like when we talk about not wanting to be bossed around, um, mm-hmm. that's one aspect of, of being autonomous or getting to decide for oneself. I think a lot of people talk about things that way, right? You know, my, my rights, my freedom, um, my, my capacity to choose. So literally the term means um, self-ruling. Uh, nomos is, is law in, in Greek and autos is self. So it, it, and it's not just getting to do whatever the hell you want, right? Uh, some people think of autonomy that way. I, I just get to do anything I want to do and then I'm autonomous. But it's really about being able to give yourself um, the rules that you're going to follow. And, and you know, maybe other people can, can mesh in with those rules because their rules are, you know, compatible with, with yours or even the same. Um, or maybe they're not. But if, you know, if our rules, you know, like think about what we're doing right now. There's, there's certain sort of unwritten expectations governing this, this activity of having a conversation um, you know, at a certain point I should shut up and you should start talking, right? If, if I just keep talking and talking and talking, it's not much of a conversation, certainly not a dialogue, right? No. And, and if you like, if you really want, to, like, if I can see that you really want to say something, I shouldn't just like keep blathering on. I should actually like take a pause like this. And speak. Exactly. And then we have a conversation of back and forth and we go forward and back. And um, another portion of, 
autonomy or to be autonomous is one making your own decisions, but also that uh, willingness and that ability to change your mind uh, given different circumstances. That once you make a decision doesn't mean that you are stuck with that one decision forever going forward. Yeah, you know, that reminds me of uh, this passage in Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher. He ran into a guy who had decided that he was, I think he was going to starve himself. And Epictetus said, you know, well, what's going on here? And the guy said, I have like decided on something. I'm sticking to it. I'm going to persevere. And Epictetus said, you know, it, it really has to be something reasonable for it to be perseverance. Otherwise, it's just obstinacy. It's like mm -hmm. picking something to do and you stick with it almost, you know, like slavishly or against the rest of the world, but you pick the wrong thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, being able to figure, you know, autonomy doesn't just mean being able to like decide anything, whatever for yourself. It means being able to decide what's good for you. Mm. Um, and, and what and is that, bad for you. Exactly. Yeah. Converse. So that you can reject it. Yeah. Yeah. And that changes as we, as we get older. I mean, I think about stupid stuff that I did at like almost every stage of my life, including well into my forties. And, you know, looking back on it, I can say, man, that was, that was not a good decision. What was going on there? Oh, I understand. Here's the decision-making process. Let's not do that again. Cause that was, that was actually, um, you know, uh, you you behaved autonomously in a sense, but you certainly didn't get yourself any closer to what's good for you. And right. sometimes you entangled yourself in what's bad for you. Um, so there's a lot of aspects to autonomy. Now, why why is it so difficult to be autonomous in a relationship? I mean, isn't it... Aren't relationships these easy things to manage where we both approach as individuals <laughs> and, you know, we kind of work out a social contract rationally between ourselves? <laughs> no? Oh, you know, we, it's, it's like oil and water, but like wanting so badly to mix. You know, we are, you know, fundamentally social creatures, but it is also so difficult for us to sit there and be like happy with all the, the other decisions that the people around us make. And especially the closer we are, the closer that we feel like those decisions that they make affect us. So, you know, you look at your uh, uh, father and their, you know, teenage child mm. and they do something that they consider to be, you know, uncool and they cringe as if they, are being destroyed and that their entire lives are falling down because like, you know, their dad made a pun or something out in public that, you know, the closer that we are, the, the closer we feel the connections and those, um, the, those effects and that reputation, uh, bring in. Yeah. Even if you don't even know anybody in that crowd and in, in the, you know, being in public, you can have that being embarrassed of your parents thing as a, uh, not just a teenager, but also like a preteen as well, I think, um, mm -hmm. go, at least going by my kids. Um, <laughs> recent experiences. Um, actually, I've, I've been pretty fortunate. I haven't had too many play, you know, times when my kids are like, oh, my God, this is terrible what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you're, 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 you know, humiliating me in public. Um, but there have been a few cases. And I remember as a kid, you know, um, going through that myself. Uh, do you remember that uh, with your with your parents or, or not? Yeah, to a certain extent. I, I was I was pretty. You're a reasonable kid in that or... regard. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I was reasonable, but in that regard, <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah, and, and we can have similar things too with like um, our friends. You know, our friends mm -hmm. can embarrass us, or we can embarrass them. Or our work colleagues, especially when we take them to other contexts, you know, think about the holiday parties. Um, mm. Those can, can oh. be a landmine in, in a way. Yeah, we, we, the saying that, like, I contain multitudes is <laughs> <laughs> absolutely correct, especially it's very much uh, context dependent and yeah, uh, how how I react and interact with you because this is a radio show and we had to keep certain topics and certain words off of exact yeah yeah exactly uh, the radio or the airwaves on um, that you know this is not a 
representation of me that you might get in a certain other context. Like if you were sitting around at the bar and, you know, yeah. having a few drinks and shooting the breeze. We're not going to mm-hmm. use the word that we'd normally use for that. <laughs> That's an example. <laughs> yeah, those, I mean, those are all interesting uh, examples. So, so autonomy is something that can often be difficult. Um, I'm going to throw an idea out there, and I don't. I'm not saying that this is actually correct. I'm just going to say a philosopher presented things this way, and the person I have in mind is Jean Paul Sartre. He, um, in in being in nothingness, and and in other things as well. I mean, no exit. You know, hell is other people. Hell is other people because of this, and it's only mm-hmm. it's only hell for for certain kinds of people. He talks about. You know, you experience the world that you're in as a subject, as um, things that you not only can act upon, but you can give value and meaning to. So he, you know, he talks about being in a yard or garden or, or I forget exactly what it is, but there, I know there's like freshly mowed grass there. And he talks about how, you know, you kind of constitute this world around you and you give it the meaning that it has. I mean, if you were from a place that didn't have lawns or anything, you, you might not know what to make of that mowed grass. And, and we, we've seen enough about, uh, we've seen enough of that to just be able to ignore it and say, ah, that's, that's, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And then he talks about another person person straying into that area. And this is typical Sartre. He talks about like all the meaning and freedom bleeding out of the environment into this like hole that the other person creates there. They their freedom to be able to like redefine the environment that they're in means that you're in a way losing your freedom. Your freedom is no longer as operative. You can't like determine the whole of of the world around you. And and think about like now kids playing with action figures and then one of them decides the game is going to be a little bit different and and the others are all upset you know how can you do this um or, and you know adults do this as well in in defining what what sort of situation they're in or what the relationship is like i think that that's one of the dangers the fact that we are autonomous individuals means that unless we can figure out how to adequately work, live, play, love together, um, we get drawn into these conflicts where it feels like the other person is dominating us or trying to, or trying to control us or trying to decide how things are going. And they may not even be doing that. We may be, it may be totally projection on our part, but if you've got somebody like a Sart, you know, if that's, that's your friend, they're going to be perpetually thinking you're doing that. Even if you're playing, doing innocuous things like playing a game with them or, you know, pouring drinks that you're going to mm. uh, share in just a minute, you know, they, they, can, they can call that into question. And so autonomy isn't so easy to, to manage as um, we'd like to think. There, there, it is a problem for a, quite a few people. So in, I love that you brought up SART and specifically No Exit. And this is that, that grand like push pull on yeah. because the, the whole play is about uh, several people who are in hell and it's not like fire and brimstone. It's just them in a room together. And the whole idea is these uh, characters are what is making it hellish for yeah, the other exactly, characters yeah. in the room. And in the end, the door is open for one of the characters and they have the opportunity to leave and they choose not to because there's that such strong pull for us to be in some sort of relationship, even one that you hate, that you will not remove yourself potentially. Yeah, and that I mean that play is great in part because each of the character has their their what's wrong with them, their their flaws, right? Mm-hmm. Their 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 screwed up edness. And they um, they try to like Inez is the one who t- says that she's really mean and you know cruel to people, um, and she you know she arguably is in it, um, but she um, still wants some sort of redemption. They all do. They all want to be. They all want their their whatever's kind of garbage in their their life and personality to be turned into something better. And and the way that you know like. Um, is it Garcon is, is the Garcon? 
the the, the main guy he proposed it's been a while for me yeah he proposes like they're gonna help each other out you know and it's not a innocent like or or spontaneous helping each other out it's like this is how we're gonna like live together in this and they can't even do that and yeah. you know hell is other people when the other people are the kind of people in that play it doesn't have mm-hmm. to be like that right it doesn't That's have that, to. but but if what if you what if you have somebody that you're involved with who's like those people in that play or what if it turns out that you're the one <laughs> who's like that, right? That's where yeah. we that's where we run into some serious problems, and and sometimes we can be absolutely blind to that. Yeah, well, there is. I mean, they they have that that saying, right? If if everybody that you've uh, dated or everybody that you're encountering is a jerk, and it's usually another word that's being used there, um, maybe it's not actually them it's you right mm-hmm. is, is is how it goes so you you could have that occur to you after a while i suppose but a lot of people develop almost like a callus of the soul that allows them not to see that right to keep mm-hmm. displacing it onto other people but let, let's i mean this is this is all good stuff for talking about the the problematic situation um and wh- you were correct it is uh Joseph Garcon. Oh, good. So my memory um, isn't, isn't failing me. And, and Inez and Estelle. Oh, Estelle, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, sort of... High society uh, woman. Exactly. Who, who, climbed her, who climbed her way up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, talk about... Uh, I don't know, maybe codependency? Yeah. How it's, it's problematic? Some, some... I mean, that's one main obstacle to autonomy and i think that um that's one that like goes to to the root of it you know um when people are codependent they are relying on on each other and on the relationship that they're in including with its sort of narrative of what the relationship is like for what autonomy ought to be delivering to them you might say um, so a lot of people will, will remain stuck in relationships that are that are not productive, and they keep doing the same cycle over and over again. And you, you look at them and you're like, "Wow, you really want to be miserable together, don't you?" Um, and, and they can be more or less so, right? But there's usually no real opportunity for growth. Um, and and, and you, so you can ask, well, what's going on there? Why why are people like this? Uh, what creates codependency? Um, and, and, you know, if you think about it in terms of causes, it could be like trauma. It could be um, having learned the lo- wrong lessons early on in life and, and it could be like a fear to try something new. But if you look at it in terms of the dynamic, you have to ask, well, what are people getting out of being stuck like that? I, I don't know if you've ever been stuck like that. I know I have at, at times. At, um, at times, uh, there's, I guess, I, I feel like a, a broken record to a certain extent, but there's that, that want or that need, especially mm-hmm. in a romantic relationship, to be in a romantic relationship. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, you, you both have your uh, a hormonal and um, motivations pushing you towards this, but also there's a strong societal push, like, oh, you should be... Um, in a relationship, you should have, be married, might have kids, you know, depending on... It's time to settle down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there's that, I guess, that fear and anxiety of, of either not or, like, being unloved or, you know, being alone forever. That could also be another, like, thing. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a, a side note here, um, and we'll come back to the main topic in a minute, but, you know, I... I um, so you know, having lived in, in in this area and the Midwest, um, I always kind of took it as well. You can always find somebody, you know. It, mm-hmm. It's it's not impossible, but you see people talking about places like New York or London or Paris um, or L.A. and they say that it's so difficult to to like meet somebody. And 
I, I think part of it has to do with the paradox of choice, right? Um, but I, I, the, the idea that, well, you get so many different people to choose from, um, mm-hmm. who would you possibly commit to? And then all the rest of the people can have that as well. But it, but it also seems to be like the standards are so high that almost mm-hmm. nobody can meet them. And, and they're all like chasing after these, these crazy things. And you, you hear and read about all these people who are, are very miserable being alone and then have, you know, like a string of, of unsatisfactory relationships with you know occasional glimmers of things being possibly great um Mm -hmm. and uh yeah i mean that's just a side note i think a lot of that depends on where where you are i mean if you if you lived way out in the sticks too and there's very few people who you could potentially get involved with you you're kind of stuck with that talent pool you might say right and I, i like this idea of um you know, one having that that massive choice, but there's also this uh, potential conflict between different relationships here. Yeah. And if you're in a you know uh, London, uh, New York, and L.A., uh, Chicago, there is a, a culture of like very um, being very. Oh, what is this? Uh, your job, your work, your, your a career is the, like, your main focus, and so this is another relationship: you versus and your work, your employer, your yeah. you know, your career goals as a relationship versus your relationship with you know your romantic partner, and there's a, a disconnect there. Yeah, that's that's quite true, and I, and I think that can arise for. Um... I was going to say, you know, a lot of other professional people, but it doesn't even necessarily need to be like recognized professions. Anybody can become a workaholic. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so going back to like, you know, thinking about codependency um, and what what traps people, what gets them stuck in these these positions. Uh, you know, some philosophers would say that it is a fear of autonomy, a fear mm-hmm. of as we're getting, we're talking sort of existentialism here. It was yeah. since we started with Sartre, this this view that if I'm actually in charge of myself and deciding for myself, I can't blame things going bad or not working on anybody else. And it feels like you know the bar gets raised. So if I if I decide I'm going to be a writer, and then I you know walk you know in 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 instead of actually writing, I do, and I'm going to use scare quotes here, research all the time, you know, uh, going down rabbit holes on the internet and uh, reading lots of other people's stuff and, uh, you know, taking my laptop to the cafe and then, you know, writing like a paragraph and saying, okay, I'm done for the day. If, if I never do anything as a writer, well, that's my own damn fault. And I'm mm-hmm. in trouble because of that, right? So not in trouble, you know, in, in any legal sense, but in, in, with myself, I can't, I can't blame it on circumstances. I can't, uh, say that somebody you, you're else creating certain expectations for yourself in which you do not lead up, uh, your actions don't actually, you know, follow through. And then you feel a sense of, I don't know, um, dread or, uh, you know, dismay at your own actions. Yeah. So in codependent relationships, when, when the two people have been in it for a while, they hold each other back. And that, prov- you know, it, it, that provides um, a kind of almost like ballast that, that stabilizes things, but it feels bad. And then you can say, oh, if it wasn't for so-and-so, I'd actually be like taking dance lessons and, you know, learning to be graceful or, um, I don't know, writing a novel or, you know, becoming, mm-hmm. going to school and, and doing these things or, you know, making a million bucks or what, whatever it's going to be. Um, that leads to resentment. Yeah. And, and, and it, you know, it goes both ways too, because the, the other person says, I never held you back. I supported you this entire time. Yeah. But you know, the kind of support that undercut autonomy mm-hmm. and I think there's a lot of people who I won't say are comfortable in that, but they don't they don't break out of it because they're more scared of what you know what would happen. I mean, this is what existentialists call anxiety, or or angst, um, uh, anguish. It's sometimes translated as this this realization that it is up to us. And so you know, oftentimes we have to have the courage to be autonomous, and that may require 
um, it feels like breaking down the relationship, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it might, it might be on, you, we might have a better metaphor saying like, sort of like, you know, when you, when you knock out the rotten walls from a house that you're going to remodel, uh, maybe the relationship doesn't have to go away entirely, but it does need, uh, granite countertops, you know, <laughs> and, you know new floor. Yeah. Hopefully the foundation is still viable. Well, that's, you know, and that's actually, that's a good point. You wouldn't really know until you start ripping away some of the stuff, right? Yeah. If we're using this housing built metaphor. on sand. Is well, it? oh, not not just that, but like you peel peel the stuff away from the walls. You don't know whether there's rotten stuff behind there until you take that drywall down mm. or plaster or whatever it is. Um, same thing with the floor, right? You know, you rip mm -hmm. up the, the, the carpet and rip up the floorboards. Now you can see whether you need to replace beams and, you know, joists and stuff like that. And so the idea here would be, what is the actual cause of this anxiety? Is this something that is actually mm. arising from this relationship? Or is this something that is derived from a previous relationship? Are you living this relationship or are you living the bad outcomes of the last relationship yeah so you, so you're talking about when when people have like a script set right mm -hmm. and they and, and again this doesn't have to necessarily be romantic relationships this could also be like um employee boss right you had a bad boss so you go in and you expect this boss is going to be a jerk just like all the other ones have been you know um we we often, or i'm a landlord so <clears throat> Like, the oh, yeah, tenant, yeah. I had a bad tenant, and so I expect the new one to be um, potentially bad, or uh, and they're not, or they're bad yeah. in a completely different way. That's true. People can often surprise us, not by not being bad, but by being bad in totally unexpected manners. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's yeah. almost it's almost sort of like that thing with the you know, you can't make anything idiot proof because an mm. idiot will always find some radically new way to screw things up. Uh, maybe we could say that about relationships. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that is that is a that is a very um, common issue with uh, just just like generals fighting the last war people or, you know, lawyers litigating the last case that they had. Um, people living out something that's like the the old relationship. So, you know, before this, we were talking about people cheating on each other, and you were saying that that was particularly damaging within relationships, right? Because once you, you know, if if that goes on, um, it's almost like the whatever foundation there was gets gets eroded. And then if you head into the new relationship and you expect, oh, it's just a matter of time or, you know, better keep the, you know, that person away from a, people that they might be attracted to or anything like that, um, it, it can almost, I, I don't want to say that it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy because that assumes that the, the partner who do the cheating somehow was just, you know, uh, necessitated that way. And, that, and I don't want to, you know, make that sort of claim because that lets them off the hook. But... Um, you know, it could make things very lonely within a relationship, being, you know, having the other person always just waiting for you to screw up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we should talk about a little bit of zero-sum approaches and um, how oh, yeah. this is uh, potentially a, a big stumbling block for making a good, useful relationships. Yeah, so you know when we talk about a zero sum game, we we talked about this before. Uh, maybe, yeah, was it last time or the time before that? It's it's from game theory. The idea of a zero sum game is a, a game where uh, any gains that I have result in losses to you, and so uh, when you sum everything up, there you know it results in zero. And so and this is in conflict or not conflict in contrast to a positive sum game where um, if we both, there's a potential that you gain and then I also gain. So for example, chess yeah. is a zero sum game. Checkers is a zero sum game. Um, you know, Monopoly is a zero sum game. Settlers of Catan isn't, is, or is it? I guess only one winner. 
Uh, you can't continue. Usually, a positive sum game yeah. are usually continuous games. So the idea is to keep on playing and not to actually have a winner. You know, uh, Minecraft. It, it, depending on what you're doing with it, mm-hmm. like you're not being the kind of person who's what they call a griever who comes along to screw things up for other people. But you look at some of the things that that people create in the Minecraft environment. Um, those are definitely positive some games, you know, yeah. they create these giant cities and, you know, like, very, who, very who wants a, a single, uh, <clears throat> skyscraper out in the middle of the cornfields of Kansas. It's, yeah. <laughs> there, there's no point in, unless you have other people and other buildings and other commerce around to actually be there. I'll tell you who movie villains. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, that's that's. I mean, that's not real life at all. So, no. <laughs> so, talking about zero sum some games, um, relationships can often wind up functioning like zero sum games, right? And that's that's one of the dangers in um, this. And so, you know, we should we should talk a little bit about how this connects up with our our theme of autonomy. Um, why does why does people being autonomous how does that connect up with, with zero-sum games? Why does that provoke the kind of reaction on some people's part to turn things into zero-sum games? I mean, we talked about the um, anxiety created by other people's freedom, and we talked about, I think you're completely right, there's this worry about like you know past relationships sometimes intruding into present relationships. Um, is there anything else going on there with, you know, people wanting to be um, autonomous. Maybe Go ahead. Jealousy, that uh, you know, idea of yeah. wanting to be either like the dominant person in a relationship to see, to keep the status quo of the relationship mm. going as much as you can. You know, there's always power dynamics. And so um, sometimes the idea that someone would gain certain rights or advantages that they have feels like they are actually losing them themselves when in fact they are not to if you if you are looking yeah. at it as a zero sum game yeah that's that's a good point um i guess another one would be like in a work environment wages if you know oh, what yeah. other people around you are having then oh but we do just about the same thing why are they getting paid so much more you know uh, or you know, they've only been here for X amount of years. How should they be getting this much money uh, when I didn't get that for X amount, X plus five years? You know, you know I worked in a place uh, because it was a state university where um, everybody's salaries were public record. Mm-hmm. And boy, did that lead to a lot of issues. Um, people would get quite upset over because you know the new people getting hired would usually get hired at a um, better rate than the people who'd been there for a while because mm-hmm. uh, you know the wages would would be increased but only only so much and um, you know you could see that like the the same cohort of people who got hired some people might have negotiated other people maybe didn't and they didn't get paid the same and it led to a lot of um, resentment uh and it also it also led to people who were getting paid more feeling like, well, why are you why are you so bothered by this? But go, going back to the zero sum game, so it's a mistake to turn you know it's a mistake to turn a relationship into a zero sum game. That's not a good recipe for a relationship. And a lot of people seem to feel that in order for them to be autonomous. Um, they have to like carve out things in such a way that the other person can't encroach on their freedom. Mm-hmm. And it, it effectively turns things into a zero-sum game, which then it's not the same thing as codependency, but it seems like a, a way to create a failing relationship, doesn't it? Yeah. The... So it's an impasse. It's a way to not manage autonomy well. So, you know, it before... goes back to that idea of like, uh, you know, you see that, that thing that like maybe be in the common area and someone put something up there and now you're like, oh, but now I can't put something up there because they've already put something up there, even yeah. though it's supposed to be a shared space that 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 misunderstood feeling like 
there's been a encroachment on my area of influence. So is it possible to be autonomous oneself in a full sense and also allow one's partner, whatever the type of relationship it is, to be fully autonomous and for it to be a a real relationship, not just sort of a, well, I've got my thing over here and you've got your thing over there. And every once in a while, maybe, you know, sort of like uh, planets, our orbits will coincide for a little bit and we'll be <laughs> in the same place at the same time. Not the same place at the same time, but at least aligned. Um, I mean, is it possible so, to have a, a robust, deep relationship and okay. have two autonomous people? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That. Um, the, I think one of the things is you need to not feel like the things that your partner does in whatever relationship you're in, um, outside of your relationship are, uh, like things that will encroach upon your own relationship too, um, that people can have interests that lie outside of what each other like that takes that, that takes have... a, a feeling of security to be able to go along with that right right yeah and so i guess that would come down to what makes good relationships and you know communication is definitely one of those things and to be a uh, very open and honest um and you know to be very upfront about what you need and the information that you need from that person and as long as you have good uh channels of communication and you are uh telling your partner that and you will have a much better way of resulting uh you know having that that strong relationship even though there might be some autonomy within the actions there yeah you know when we're communicating with each other, um, in a lot, of, when we when we argue, when we fight, it's through communicating, and we can communicate in verbal and nonverbal ways. You know, giving somebody the silent treatment is a, is a communication with them. It's hey, you're a jerk, and I don't want to talk to you, and I'm gonna you know keep doing this for however long. Um, one of the aspects of communication that that ties in with autonomy that I think is quite difficult in relationships is. Um, you know, communicating is never just a matter of, of straight out information. It always involves values. Mm -hmm. It always involves how we feel about things and what we think about them and judgments that we're making. So, you know, if I'm willing to, let's say we're talking about a friendship like, like you and me, um, if I'm willing to allow you to uh, express the values that matter to you within the way that we communicate, um, I'm allowing you to be more autonomous or to express your autonomy and creating space for your autonomy, right? In a way that can then feel, I don't know, respectful for you or supportive or valued. Whereas if I'm trying to make you communicate in the same way that I do, that's probably going to be a failure and it's a, a lack of respect for your autonomy. And you'd probably feel it as an imposition if I'm like, um, I, I, you know, I talk this way and I say these sort of things, you need to do that exact sort of thing too, or else we can't be friends. You know, um, I think you, you would, you would view that re, you know, quite rightly so as, um, an attempt to control you and control right. isn't really compatible with autonomy. I, I would go continue in that same vein to the idea of, you know, um, being afraid to say something because it might upset your partner. Oh yeah. Even though it's a very important thing for you and you uh, feel a, uh, a need to restrain because your uh, partner is so, I don't know, I guess fragile, non-resilient, uh, yeah, um, liable to that, fly off the handle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's, bad for both of you like if, if you if you're the one that is the fragile one um then how can you have open and, how can you have a partner that feels like they can be open and honest with you and the other one feels like their autonomy is being restricted 
yeah, and that feels bad. It, it, there, we have a sort of negative, <clears throat> negative reaction to it. I mean, I, I remember reading Cicero talks about this. He, he says that it's natural to human beings to want to not just feel free, but actually be able to do things like a free person, you know. And he's writing this in a slave society, uh, quite interestingly. <laughs> so he's, he's kind of recognizing that a lot of the population is probably, you know, pretty ticked off at any given point in time. But I think in relationships, there, there's, there's quite a few cases where, where, you know, people trample over each other's autonomy. And then, you know, when, when somebody starts to get upset about it, it turns into a fight, but oftentimes they don't get to, to the, what the real core core issue is, which is that we we have to be willing to show each other a certain kind of respect. And respect for another person's autonomy doesn't mean just showing respect in the way that we would like it. It means, you know, showing respect in the ways that they can recognize and, and would like as well. So, like, if you were to tell me, I don't like when you say this word. Um, and I'm like, well, that's a totally arbitrary imposition. And, you know, who are you to tell me how I can talk? Um, the problem's with me, not with you. I mean, it may, there may be some weird psychological reason why you don't like a certain word. Like, I can't mm -hmm. say, you know, uh, Tweedledum, you know, because <laughs> you had yeah. a traumatic experience at, I don't know, Disneyland or something like that, right? And I mm -hmm. have terrible flashbacks. But if I can't, if I can't respect, recognize and respect that, um, there's a problem there and the problem is more on my side than on yours. Right. And it's kind um, of a silly example. I, yeah, uh, I guess I, I, I miss the whose side is who here. Well, you're, I would be the one who would not be respecting your autonomy in determining, um, what, what counts as respect for you. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, Coming to freedom, this kind of reminds me of you know how in our technological age we have new tools that allow us to communicate, but they also are new tools that we can use to restrict the freedoms of the people that we're in relationships with. And so yeah. I see this, you know, you know, if we have cell phones in our pockets and we are obsessively able to be contacted at any point in time, then we have. Uh, the ability to, if one person in a relationship is overly controlling, um, to be able to uh, get in contact with them and expect them to respond at any point in time. And, and you're seeing this actually a lot with our, our lockdown and having so many people work from home. There's been mm. a massive uptick in monitoring software for uh, people working at yeah, home. And oh, so yeah. the, the software takes a photo of you with the camera, takes a photo of whatever you're working on, uh, makes a point to like give a report about uh, what things that you're looking at, both in your browser, like how many times you're you're working on your like documents or your spreadsheets, as well as like it will only count time worked on something if you're typing keys or moving your wow. mouse. Um, and will like present whole reports, which I seem is like I wish that people that were doing this were just saying, okay, what is the thing that you actually want in this work relationship? It's the output, right? It's not like you want someone to be staring at a single document for eight hours a day, especially well, if you're doing anything um, creatively worked. There are certain things that it. are like, you know, you have to figure out the good metric, and certain metrics will require you to be like, if you're doing sales or something, you have to be on yeah. the phone a lot. But if you're yeah. you're doing tickets for uh, tech support or something, then it's the number of tickets that you get through. And as yeah. long as that hits a certain metric, then what does it matter? I think though that for some people, the metrics aren't what they're really after they they do want to dominate the other person or control the other person for whatever reason you know oh, yeah um there's an interesting right. thing the, oh right yeah yeah and, and it's not just that it's not right it is it is you know ethically wrong but it's also damaging to oneself and to the other person and to the relationship it, it, it creates all sorts of resentments um there's a there's a big controversy right now um 
it's the end, end of the semester and you know we're, we did the pivot to online for education and there are quite a few people, professors who are like trying to make tests as difficult for their students as possible and trip them up and you know wondering how they can keep the students from possibly cheating and there's a lot of you know thought and, and uh, um, not ink so much but you know <laughs> pixels being devoted to this. And you know my attitude is, um, wow, you must really distrust your students if that's what your focus is and if you're trying to make like problem one of the things is making making tests that they can't possibly solve you know uh you say, why the hell would you do that to like mm -hmm. rub their nose in in you know how you know how little they know or something like that the point of education isn't to tear students down it's to you know build them up um but i think a lot of professors have <clears throat> have lost sight of that. And, and I think there's a lot of bosses who probably have lost sight of that as well. We I, should... I remember a time oh. where I took a, a three-hour coding exam that was remote, and so they uh, required me to install monitoring software on my wow. computer, and they would not allow me to use the restroom once the exam started. And so about two and a half hours in, I really needed to use the restroom. Yeah, yeah. And um, like, there's a proctor. It's like, can I leave to use the restroom? Like, no. And I'm like, well, why would I ever want to work for you? If this is the way that you're going to treat point. me when I go <laughs> yeah. into, you know, this type of thing. I, it was a very bad experience on my part. Uh, that's I think actually, we should that, hit that question really quick. Yeah, but that's that's actually a really good point. You can say this also very quickly about like job interviews. Uh -huh. If you go to a job interview and they treat you like like garbage, why would you ever want to work there? Because that's the one time they have to like show you sort of like the date. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody is terrible on a date, why would you want to be in a relationship with them? Right? But yeah, let's <laughs> let's go to the question, which kind of ties in with the cell phone thing, right? Yeah. So there's a. From Reddit, with from Redditor um, Intimidator, <laughs> says, So it seems like she can't go half a day without calling me or texting me to help her with something. I always go and help because I'm a nice guy and I love her a lot. But she especially likes to do it when I'm actually busy and need to get things done. She expects me to take time out of my day. And believe me, believe it or not, my time is actually very valuable to go watch her dogs for a couple of hours while she goes and does something fun. And he's asking, like, is this a right or wrong? What do you think, Greg? I think that that's a pretty screwed up relationship, most likely. And, it, I mean, it's interesting that in just asking this, this is clearly, I would say, somebody who is in a quandary about this. They're wondering whether this is normal or this is abnormal. Um even being kind of in in the dark about that, I'd say, is, is a problem sign, wouldn't you? Yeah, the it, it's. I assume that this is a early relationship, and you know, oh, we're yeah. always rather blind, and uh, you know, thinking like, "Wow, like it's so great," and you you get those to all be those in endorphins. A relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, love is blind, especially in the first you know six months, and. And he's just finally realizing, like, coming up for air and like, oh, this doesn't seem like I'm in a relationship where my partner respects my time and, I guess, my autonomy to a certain extent. Well, I, I think this is an interference with autonomy. If, if you're trying to get something done and, and do something yourself and then you have somebody calling you and expecting that you should, like, drop what you're doing – and join in on, on whatever it is that they want done, that's not allowing you to decide what to do with your time, what to do with your day. Um, I mean, there's probably a lot, dogs are nice, but there's probably a lot more valuable things to do than watching dogs. Um, it's the, the, not even like going in and spending quality time with your partner. <clears throat> it's, can you do this thing so <laughs> I can do something else? Yeah, that I think that's a real red flag. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that we were talking about a little bit earlier is communication. And this sounds like a, a uh, relationship where some communication is happening. She's, you know, texting him or phoning him and saying, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And he's saying, 
okay, I guess I'll do, I'll, I'll change my day and do that. But there, he's, he's not definitely not communicating with her about, um, how this makes him feel or whether it, it shows that he's being devalued and what he would like in the relationship. So I, it seems a real problem to me. So I think we should move on to our practice here. Um, Which ties in with this, I think, quite yeah. quite well, right? Would you please uh, tell us about it? So, you know, I think we can just call this a, a communication practice. You know, some of the practices that we've looked at are, are more action-oriented or mindfulness-oriented, uh, you know, where you're thinking about something. This has to do with how you're approaching somebody else. And the, you know, the thing that, that it's... It, it's absolutely centered on is doing something, namely telling your partner what it is that you want. And I think a lot of people wait until they've crossed a certain line and they're like, that's it. I've had it. Now I'm going to tell you exactly what I want. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to um, deliberately tell your partner at a good time, hey, this is this is what I, I need from you. This is what I want from you. This is what makes me feel supported or loved or respected or whatever whatever it is in the, in the modality of the relationship. And so there's there's a couple, you could say, components to this. One is thinking to yourself before you actually get there, well, what is it that you want to convey to them? What is it that you actually do want? Sometimes when we think about things, it turns out that there's a difference between needs and desires and wants and whims. Uh, some of the things that we say we're we absolutely have to have are kind of, you know, either negotiable or, or turn out not, not to be that important. So clarifying for ourselves is, is very important. And then, um, you know, you don't want to make it dramatic. There's a tendency, I think, uh, and a temptation for a lot of people to invest communication with a lot more drama than it needs. It, it's, it's perfectly fine to say to the other person, listen, I... You know, in the case of this guy, he could say, listen, um, my time is valuable. I would like to spend it on things that I want to do or with you. I don't want to, for example, um, watch your dogs while you go off to do, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. And you can say that to a person in a calm way without, you know, bringing in all sorts of other extraneous matters, right? Mm -hmm. But that requires a little bit of practice, I think. Um, so this reminds me a lot of some a really good advice that I heard from Dan Savage, and uh, it's a, a reframing device. And it's who says, oh, good. When you two are fighting, you both need to remember that it's you two versus the problem, not you versus him. If it's you versus him, then they both lose. Yeah, that's that's actually a great way to frame it. Um, and it's and the problem isn't just a wedge to use against the other person too. It's it's mm -hmm. something that you want to try to resolve. So I, I guess you know another thing that would fit in with this is reminding oneself about the value of the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. That you know ultimately you want things to be better. I mean this is where, this is where you can tell whether you're codependent or not. If you if if you're codependent, you actually don't want the relationship to be better. You want it to, to you know, stay the same. And this is where you can tell whether you're kind of sadistic or not, or cruel, right? If maybe you really do want just to beat the other person up, well, you know, then it's up to them whether they want to stick around for that. And then yeah. you might, you know, if you realize that, you might want to take a look at yourself. <laughs> so, we should yeah. uh, we should uh, wrap up. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I I think just you know. Don't expect your partner to read your mind as well to uh, add to that practice. You know, it's been pretty yeah. good, how it's been. Well, do you want to have any last thoughts or yeah, good I guess quotes so to end on? Uh, close this week out with a quote from Daniel H. Pink. Control leads to compliance. Autonomy leads to engagement. <laughs>